<laughs> so, uh, what will be the, uh, the, the to topic of the first session? We've been discussing a lot about excellence and equity. We have, we've been discussing a lot about every school being a good one. Uh, we've been discussing about whole school models, which can be extremely inspiring and, and so forth. But if, you, if we really want to make the change happen at scale, we need to make it happen in every country of the world, every, every, uh, and every city of the world, every school of the world, and so on. And it's easy to say on paper, it's really complicated to make, make it happen in practice. Practice, and, and, and luckily we have two brave ones who have been willing to share their opinions, their uh, challenges uh, on, on this topic. We are discussing about the city of Helsinki, and, and the state of Oregon in the US. And then we will start with, with the city of Helsinki. And I'm, I'm proud and I'm extremely happy that we are having the deputy mayor of, of Helsinki, Pia Pakarinen, who is responsible for education in, in the hometown. So let's start with Pia. Welcome to the stage. Thank you, Saku. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the city of Helsinki. Let's start with a video. Helsinki wants to be in a leading role in many different aspects like digitalization, smart cities, collaboration with startups, and uh, we really grab that challenge at school as well. The school system here, it's unique. No matter what your background, your social demographic factors behind you, you can make anything about your life uh, because of education. All our students have good opportunities to learn with the modern technologies. Since we have had this uh, equal and uh, open education for everybody, has provided some kind of excellence to everybody in the whole nation in Finland. We want every school to be a good school. At our school we embrace inquiry-based learning. That means that the child brings the questions. I feel that the best thing about my own school is uh, the teachers and how they teach. Our lessons are completely like discussions and talks and I actually learn things and it's very fun. Teachers are now more like coaches and friends. Kind of enablers and guides. He's like a other parent for student. Of course, there's still uh, you have to have discipline in the class, and we help them to find ways of teaching themselves. They gave me inspiration and motivation. I want to do something really important in this earth. I want to learn how we can like get prepared for the future. That's also something that us teachers need to remember that we have really, really clever and wise students in our classrooms who have also a lot to give us. We have had quite good results in PISA, but uh, good is not good enough. So we have to be curious and also learn from others. We can be better every day, but we also have mercy for each other, so we don't have to compete. We are concentrating on learning, not on teaching. We're not ready yet. We will see what, what happens at the last page of the book. And maybe then there's another book coming. That's the curiosity. We want to welcome you all to the city of Helsinki to learn new things every day together. Helsinki is safe and a bit quiet, small, beautiful, inspiring, joyful, be innovative, diverse, full of nature, full of culture, great place to learn. Do you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, Finland is a small nation. 
So we never had the option of educating only few segments of our population. Uh, for instance, only kids of uh, wealthy families or uh, boys, for example. No, we need it and still need everyone. And uh, that's actually what we mean by our motto or our strategy. We want to be the most uh, impactful place for learning in the world. It means that no matter, as I said in the video, no matter what your social demographic background is, no matter uh, how modest is the home you are coming from, you can be a president of Finland, you can be a chief of a big company, or a happy taxpayer. Actually, we need a lot of happy taxpayers because uh, education is an investment. Uh, excellence and equity. I generally believe that it's not very difficult to establish one very excellent school. We pick up the best teachers, we pick up the best uh, students, and uh, have enough resources, and it's there. What is more challenging is to have every school a good school. And that's what we aim, aim at. Uh, there's nowadays a lot of talk about diversity, we should have diversity, more diversity at workplaces. We should have more diversity at schools. Uh, we did not have to invent diversity. Uh, it's inherent in the Finnish system, where about 90% of the families choose uh, the nearest school for their uh, first graders. So the whole neighborhood is there. Uh, bottom down is one of our principles. We have the privilege of having the best teachers in the world, I would say, the best educated teachers with university degree, and uh, also the best students, because the, the profession of a teacher is very highly valued in Finland. And of those teachers, those with the best leader skills are chosen to be the principals. Every uh, school looks very much like their principal, because uh, we give a lot of latitude, a lot of freedom to the schools and uh, want to use their imagination. You have probably already seen during this week a lot of innovations that are going on in, their, in our schools, and uh, they are invented by our teachers. So uh, bottom down means that we believe that the best innovations are made at schools by the teachers, for the teachers and the children, which of course are the focus of education. And uh, I think that's, if, if you would ask me what is our secret, I would say that uh, it, it is the well-educated teachers. I hope you have enjoyed this week. I hope you have uh, had the opportunity to see what, what we do here in, in the schools of Helsinki. I think that Helsinki Education Week could be a platform for a long-lasting friendship for all those who are, are believers in education. And uh, I thank you very much for coming to Helsinki. Thank you. Thank you, Pia. Uh, we'll go to a debate in a minute, and, and now I'm proud to invite our guests from the state of beautiful state of Oregon, uh, Vanessa Wilkins, who is the founder of, of Future School Lab, and, and Whitney Krupps, executive director of Chalkball Project. The stage is yours. Thank you. Well, I can't tell you how wonderful it's been to be here and how humbling it is for us from the state of Oregon to share the stage with the city of Helsinki in order to talk about how to make all schools great, um, because we're very much on a, on a journey toward excellence in our state. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of context. Um, so Oregon is a state on uh, the west coast of the United States. It's just above California, which most people know where that is. Um, and we have in our state um, 
a really rich diversity, um, and that is both in terms of um, racial ethnic status. We have a lot of uh, students of color, African American, Native American, Latinx students. Um, we have uh, a lot of racial or er, socioeconomic diversity, and we also have um, both an urban center uh, in our state as well as m many rural areas. We are a state that really prides ourselves on a history of deep collaboration and working together, uh, working together across sectors, uh, business sector, public sector, private sector, um, as well as um, just working together in our communities to solve problems that are important to us. Um, and we have set for ourselves some really ambitious goals in our state. Um, we have a goal which we call the 40-40-20 goal, uh, which means that what we are shooting for is to have 40% of our students earning uh, a four-year degree, uh, a bachelor's degree or higher, 40% of our students um, earning at least an associate's degree, a two-year degree, or a technical certificate, and every other student having at least a rigorous high school diploma. Um, and what this goal means for our state is really, um, it's a commitment. It's a commitment to ensuring that every child, no matter where they're from, has the same opportunity. Um, and when I look at kind of the flip side of each of those goals, or each of those um, uh, positive attributes, I'd say there's challenges as well. And so in our state, we've really, um, like all of the United States, been struggling with political polarization, uh, struggling with um, racial bias, uh, struggling with really how do we meet those ambitious goals in the context in which we live. Um, and so my work uh, is primarily been in policy making, in trying to shape the way that um, our legislature invests in education and shape the laws that drive our education system in order to make sure that we can do system level change uh, in addition to the, to the building and classroom level change. Um, and so in 2011, um, I had the honor of serving for f about five years as a policy advisor, education advisor, to the governor of our state. Um, and in that time period, that governor brought in a very, um, a really deep vision for how he wanted our system to change. Um, and a couple of things that, that I will mention that we worked on, um, one being thinking about our education system as being from cradle to career. So currently, we have a system that's very fragmented um, for the early childhood, the K-12, and the higher education. We have different um, governance systems, different ways of investing, different models in those different systems. And what that translates to for children um, is really as they move through the system, there's a lot of gaps and there's a lot of transition and there's a lot of um, opportunities for kids to fall through the cracks and get, get um, off track. And so our seamless system of education really signaled we wanted, we wanted these systems to be working together. We wanted early childhood teachers to be talking with um, primary school teachers, for families to be sort of walked from one uh, level to the next. At the, at, at the upper level, it was about really, could we get college faculty and high school teachers to work together to really talk about what they uh, expected from students and how to make that transition more smooth. Um, the other thing I'll mention is um, we did focus a lot at the investment level. So what, where we put our money is where we, was what we value. And so we worked a lot on thinking about investing in education and how you use those investments to drive change. Um, and now I'll jump forward to, um, to, to where I am now, which is called the Chalkboard Project. Um, I am the executive director of this organization that was founded by five of our largest philanthropies. Um, so they came together, um, pooled their resources, and decided that they wanted to tackle the, the challenge of improving education at the system level. Um, and the way that we've done that at the Chalkboard Project is really through um, investing in seeding pilot projects, um, innovations on the ground level, 
um, focused on uh, elevating um, both the elevating teachers' voices in the policymaking sector, so getting teachers to really be able to, to talk with policymakers, as well as really helping to support teachers' practices in the classroom and give them what they need to be able to do their work better. Um, and the result of this has been that we've been able to pass 12 uh, different pieces of legislation, laws that are aimed at ensuring that um, teachers have access to mentors, that we're collecting regularly um, data on how teachers feel about their working conditions, uh, that we are, um, that we have uh, created a structure actually in our state called an Educator Advancement Council that the governor of our state appoints the members to, and those are educators, teachers, classroom teachers that get to help us guide our state's policy. Um, and I would say the other success is that we have, Chalkboard Project has been able to take the learnings from all of its innovative pilot projects and get state public dollars set aside at this point about $40 million in a fund that is aimed at scaling those, um, those innovations across the state and ensuring that rather than having um, it just be a few places, we're working toward getting every teacher to have access to better support. Um, through this process, our focus has also really been around equity and thinking much more deeply about what students need and why our system hasn't been serving students well, particularly African American students, Native American students, um, and non-English speakers in our, in our state. Um, and so thinking about how to help our teachers be more culturally responsive, how to help our teachers really address um, their own biases that they bring. And one thing that's impressed me here in, in Finland is that we've really felt from every teacher that, that deep sense that every child can learn. Um, and I think that is where it is that we're hoping to drive things in our state. I'll pass it over to Vanessa. Thank you. So my name is Vanessa Wilkins, and I am the founder of Future School Lab, which is an action tank to support innovation in education. Um, and I thought I would give you a third example. Whitney's just given you two examples of ways that we've tried to address systems change and make every school a good one in Oregon through policy and through a collaboration of five foundations, the largest foundations in our state. My example is actually from the business world, uh, and it's also a deep collaboration with many uh, foundations as well. I believe that a spark for innovation can come from literally anywhere in the system, from students, from teachers, from principals, from community-based organizations around a school, and even from a business who clearly has a huge stake in making sure that the workforce is ready and prepared for the careers of tomorrow. Um, and so a few years ago, I had the distinct honor and pleasure of creating and implementing a program um, from Nike called the Nike School Innovation Fund. Um, and what we did was we launched in 2014, and we invested $6 million over a period of four years in 100 high schools to accelerate innovation in education. Um, and in this work, we actually partnered with several other foundations, importantly, the James L. and Marion F. Miller Foundation, led by Martha Richards, who's a real champion in our state for kids, um, came alongside us and invested uh, four more $4 million more in middle schools and elementary schools that lined, aligned our system of high schools um, to try and really address that seamless pathway of education. And then we had uh, additional support and partnership from the Meyer Memorial Trust. My friend Matt Morton is here today in the audience, as well as Kali Thorne from Kairos, an incredible elementary school in, uh, in Portland Public Schools that's pioneering new ways to serve African American kids that frankly are the best ways to serve all kids. Um, we also had partnership actually from the state of Oregon and the Oregon Community Foundation. And so through this partnership, we were able over four years to address, well, our goals were to raise our graduation rates, uh, close the achievement gap, which um, it may be an American term, but it refers to the fact that we're pretty good at serving white middle class children in our country, but we're not very good at serving underserved populations of kids who come from different backgrounds. And so the gap between the way that we serve these kids is uh, called the achievement gap in the United States, and that was importantly what we wanted to close. And so that the way that we address this work is we realized that, first of all, Nike knows nothing about education, right? Um, and so we partnered with an 
incredible organization called AVID, who serves 2 million um, children or youth across the United States and trains 70,000 teachers every year. And we found AVID after looking for six months for best practices all across the United States, and then realizing that actually the people that knew what we should do were right here in our own backyard. And so we talked to teachers, principals, and superintendents who all said that they'd seen this incredible program, AVID, that um, was the best professional development they'd ever seen for teachers. They'd seen it work in our state, and they wanted more. And so that's what we decided to invest in statewide with all of those, excuse me, all of those assets. Um, and I'm pleased to report, uh, three years later, we have just released, or it's being released this month, an evaluation by a third-party evaluator that's shown that it's actually working. So graduation rates um, in the high schools that have this program that we invested in um, have gone up significantly more than high schools that are not implementing this program. In addition, importantly, 94% of the students in the AVID program report that it, AVID has made them a better student. 94%, I'm informed by the evaluators, is quite an incredible, um, incredible rate for uh, students to report. So we're thrilled with that work. Um, and in addition, I wanted to mention two other important pieces from the private sector that Nike did that I think um, both make the program uh, more impactful for the people at Nike, which was important to us for our employees and our leaders, um, and also help sort of bring some of Nike's best skills and assets to the work. So we paired teach, excuse me, principals from high schools around the state with executives from our company to innovate, and we supported them with grants to do whatever they thought was important to try. Um, and then finally, and also very importantly, we um, leveraged Nike's ability to inspire, which is really part of their mission and part of what they do really well, um, to bring teachers together at huge events where we both made them feel valued, which is really important and part of, I think, what's so wonderful about the city of Helsinki and the country of Finland, and also created that network across the state so that they would have support as they went on this journey to implement change in their schools to serve all kids better. Um, and we were really pleased this spring when Harvard uh, did a case study on the Nike School Innovation Fund and actually just published it this, this spring where they're using it to teach students in the Graduate School of Education at Harvard and the Harvard Business School how to uh, create shared value, which is simply the idea that for businesses to invest in social causes that are related to their mission and their employees makes good sense. That's all it means. So we're not there yet in Oregon. It's a very long uh, journey, but I'm so pleased that we're making progress. And um, I believe really strongly that we can serve all kids, all kids well. Um, and I forgot that I had more slides. Yes, here. So we thought we have these three examples that we'd share with you. Um, and then we wanted to sort of pull out some themes that were really, you know, what are the levers for change? And so here's what the three things that Whitney and I agreed were really critical to making change in your school, district, state, country. Um, and the first one we've heard a lot about yesterday, right? Putting students at the center. But that is so easy to say and so incredibly hard to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think it takes courageous leadership, which is an absolutely crucial piece of change um, or innovation work in any organization, be it a school, a nonprofit organization, or a business, um, to put students at the center and to remember every single day that whatever works for them, even if it's not convenient for adults or the system, is how we should be changing our schools. The next um, lever for change is obviously to articulate your a true identity. And when I say that, I mean, what are your core values? What are the values that you share? Whether it's just within your, your school, within your state, within a network of schools, or within a district. And agree, agreeing on those values really is your North Star and, and um, can guide you through the work that's going to be very hard as you implement change, right? Um, but once you have a shared identity and a vision and some goals, the other most important thing is to give autonomy, which Finland does so incredibly well. Autonomy equals trust within a system, and um, we used to call it freedom within a framework, right? So once you have a framework and you know who you are and where you're going, let teachers do whatever it takes to innovate for their students. And that's the way that we think you can get to real change. Thank you. Thank you, Sako, so much Please for letting us share the stage. May I leave that?
Uh, y yesterday, we, when we were talking about making change happen, we divided it in three parts. First is that you have to have some sort of direction, meaning this is where we want to go. Then you have to find innovations that, that can take you there, and then everything has to be implemented well. Yes. And all of these are quite difficult. <laughs> so let's start with a direction, meaning where do we want to go? And, and there's so many stakeholders. There's, there's public debate, there's media, there's parents, uh, there's workforce, there's politicians, and so on. So, Pia, can you, can you start kind of like how difficult in these times, because everyone has an opinion mm -hmm. about how school should look like? Well, you answered the question yourself, because everyone has a, an opinion about the schools and also, uh, for instance, the parents, they think, and also the politicians, they think <laughs> how the school was, uh, was in their age. And, uh, of course, all the changes are a, a big debate. Uh, so it is challenging, because, uh, of course, we don't have proof uh, before we have tried. And well, while we try, of course, there's a big debate also. But, uh, but I think that, uh, yes, this discuss discussion helps us to be better. So it's good that people are interested in school. With you, Vanessa. Oh, sorry. We, May I, I would just add to that, that um, I think it's such an important debate to have. We do, everyone in the world, I think, whoever has been to school, believes they're an expert in school. And in truth, we are kind of, because we know what it was like for us to go through that schooling. But schools look really, really different today than they did, for example, when I was a student. If you actually go into the classrooms and see the deeper learning that's going on, the collaboration, um, some of the critical thinking practices that they're doing. So I think it's really important to open the doors to your school and not be um, not be secretive. I mean, it's just like having open doors for classrooms, right? Um, we have to share and we should welcome parents, community members, businesses into the schools to talk to us about what they're seeing, what they, you know, what their experience was, how we can be better for everyone. With me. I would just quickly say in our, our state and our country, the, the sort of political polarization around many issues is challenging. Um, and I think a critical thing to do is to really go down to the level of uh, students, parents, and families and have their voice, help elevate their voice in the conversation because again, yeah. it's very easy for <clears throat> adults to get entrenched in their ideas about what it is they think is needed. But when you talk to kids and families and communities, the picture becomes a lot clearer and a lot more uh, impactful. Uh. How do you see at the moment, moment, there's a lot of discussion about change and, and visiting a lot of countries, listening to education debate. It, at the moment, it's actually quite interesting because there are a lot of people who want to make change happen and some of them are coming outside of the traditional education sector. There's philanthropics, there's, there's billionaires, there's millionaires, there's <laughs> companies and so on. So they come and quite often what, what, what happens is that they actually kind of like break the system. And, and, so, so it's, and, and there's a lot of discussion about reform madness, which means that you make a change and before you have even implemented the change, you start a new change and then there's a teacher in the classroom saying that, could you please relax and let me teach? Mm -hmm. so, so how do you see sort of like, should we make the change happen extremely fast, extremely slow, uh, the world is changing and, and so on. So you understand this kind of like the struggle between different kind of stakeholders. Well, I think we should have the speed of the teachers because, uh, as I said, uh, I return to this uh, bottom down, bottom uh, down. we can force the change. And the keys to the change are the teachers, of course, the principals of the school and the teachers. And uh, we just can't bring something to the school that they don't accept. So I think the speed is uh, dictated by the teachers and uh, uh, we, of course we have to give them inspiration and, and uh, let them see the world, what is happening, happening everywhere else and uh, to give them feedback on that, but they decide. When we were discussing with the head of education in Helsinki, Lisa Pohjola, and asking, asking what is the biggest challenge she sees at the moment, the answer was how to take good care of teachers, how to mm. keep them motivated, how to re-energize them. <laughs> and, and that's complicated mm. because they are the ones who are on the, on the classroom. Uh, exactly, and I think your question hit at 
a central tension that I feel each and every day, which is the urgency of making change is great. We're talking about kids' lives and, um, as you would say in Finland, natural resources being mm. wasted every day. And at the same time, we've tried over and over again, kind of top-down, quick, silver bullet solutions, and they don't work because it truly is about changing the culture and you need the educators to be driving that change. They need to care about it. They need to have space and we need to stay the course on something that's meaningful. Um, but it's really in tension with the, the, the urgency and the fact that we need something good to happen for kids now. But, but what, what do you think, uh, Van, Vanessa, for example, uh, does the change happen because If it happens top down, it's complicated because teachers are not motivated. If it happens bottom up, it's complicated because it's slow. So does the change happen bottom up, top down, or both? I think it has to be both, actually. Yeah, yeah. and I think the, I mean, the investment can come from outside. I do think teacher ideas are the most valuable, and that's where a lot of the innovation should come from. But there are good ideas coming from students. We just heard from Jordi, who's incredible. Um, good ideas coming from students. Good ideas coming from the outside. And I think it's really important that we let people, whether it's a teacher or a principal, or, and even students, just try things. You know, and not don't expect it to be. Um, let them fail. You know, it's okay to fail. That's how we learn, all of us. Um, and so I think that's just a really important philosophy to have. The, the last last question, um, education has been extremely local. All the countries, all the states have been silos. And in here, there's been, for example, one of the key things in here has been the, the, some kind of dialogue between countries and so on. Do you see it as a realistic future that education is becoming truly global, which means that schools are operating across borders, innovations are spreading, and so on, so that instead of having silos, we are having a genuine cooperation? Well, I think it's inevitable. Uh, everything else is global. How could uh, education uh, remain uh, like a silo? It's not possible, and I, I think it's a good uh, because we can learn from each other. And as I said, I would like uh, Helsinki Edu Week, Ed Education Week to be a platform for this change. I think we. I think it's important that it be global. I think um, we're seeing in our country the sort of. Um, impact of, of isolation and what that does to your mind and being able to open people up by introducing them uh, to other ideas from other countries is critical. At the same time, I do think everything is um, highly contextualized and being really attentive to what um, what particular cultures, communities, and localities bring is also important. And I would just say, I think it's so valuable to do what we're doing here today, like exchanging ideas with people from other cultures, um, because it not only helps you get inspired by what they're doing, learn a new possible innovation, but it also gives you the opportunity to reflect back on yourself and you see your own context, your own schools, your own work in a completely different light. It just, you know, it sort of illuminates your assumptions, what's working, what's not. And I think the four of us are going back with some huge learnings from Helsinki and from people here in this room that I think will have a tremendous impact on our state. Okay, and I, I'll finish with, what, with one comment which I try to be saying again and again and again. The education system all over the world is full of great people who are trying to do their best. And, and, and when everybody are complaining, I'm saying that making change happen at scale is really complicated. So I think that we have to have patience as well for those people who are trying to make the change happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.